Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, we're moving on now to Chapter 6, which talks about aquatic biodiversity. Again, in Chapter 5, we talked about uh, terrestrial biodiversity and climate. Now, with aquatic biodiversity, obviously, climate is not going to play a major role because we're talking about now what happens in the water, okay? And so that's what this chapter is going to be all about. So we start off, uh, once again, this chapter, I think about 57 slides. Uh, so once again, we'll split this up into two parts. So this is part one. We start off with a core case study. Why should we care about coral reefs? Well, coral reefs are among the world's oldest, most diverse, and most productive ecosystems. They form in clear, warm coastal waters in tropical areas. Tiny animals called polyps and single-celled algae have a mutualistic relationship. So basically, they're they're living together uh, in 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 this in this relationship, and that's what actually creates the coral. Polyps secrete calcium carbonate shells, which end up becoming the coral reef. So they provide important ecological and economic services for us. So what do they do, these coral reefs? Well, they are a natural barrier to protect coastlines. Again, you have this coral reef in the water. When you uh, start to get big storms to come, they actually are a na natural barrier, which actually helps reduce flooding uh, along coastlines. Their habitat, food, and or spawning grounds for one quarter to one third of the ocean's organisms. So think about that, up to 33% of the ocean's organisms between 25 and 33% use coral reefs for either habitat, food, or, or for places to breed. In addition, unfortunately, our coral reefs are very vulnerable to damage from either soil runoff, climate change, which is increasing ocean temperature, or the increasing ocean acidity uh, that is happening because of the excess carbon uh, that we have in the air. So all of this is uh, create a, a real problem for our coral reefs because they are very vulnerable to damage. So this is a picture of a coral reef. You'll notice in the middle here, it is bleached. So where you see white, that is a dead, uh, that's dead coral. And again, that's the problem that we're having now around the world uh, because of these uh, issues, mainly uh, the increased uh, ocean temperature, really the main reason. But those other two reasons we talked about uh, are reasons as well uh, why coral reefs are unfortunately uh, dying out around the world. And because of those uh, economic and ecological services I showed you on the previous slide, uh, we need to care about those coral reefs. All right, so what is the general nature of aquatic systems? And again, when we use the word aquatic, uh, we're talking about water here, okay? So saltwater and freshwater aquatic life zones cover almost three-fourths of the Earth's surface. Factors that determine aquatic biodiversity. So again, for terrestrial biodiversity, the factors were mainly the climate, right? For aquatic biodiversity, these are the four factors that are important in, in determining uh, the biodiversity of an aquatic area. Temperature of the water, the dissolved oxygen content in the water, that's your DO, the availability of food, and the access to light and nutrients necessary for photosynthesis. All right, so once again, most of the earth is covered with water. Salt water covers 71% of earth's surface. Fresh water occupies another 2%. But again, the fresh water that we can use, right, that we can access, we had this on the previous test question, much, much lower than that, right, under 1%. Global ocean is divided into five areas. So again, we talk about different oceans, but in general, it really is a global ocean because all the oceans are connected to one another. However, we do divide them into five areas, the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific, Arctic, Indian, and the Southern Ocean. Distribution of organisms determined largely by salinity. What is salinity? Well, how much salt is in the water, right? So aquatic life zones are saltwater life zones, marine life zones, all right? So examples, oceans, estuaries, coasts, coral reefs, and mangrove forests, okay? Those would be saltwater aquatic life zones, and we call them marine. Freshwater life zones, this is going to be your lakes, your rivers, your streams, and your inland wet areas that, again, are freshwater and not salt water. So the types of organisms that are living in your aquatic system obviously going to be determined by the salt water or the fresh water. Fresh water animals can't live in salt water. Salt water animals can't live in, 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 in fresh water in most cases. Okay, so that will be uh, how those organisms are distributed. All right, so 
aquatic species like to drift, swim, crawl, and or cling. So we're going to go through a couple of terms here, uh, different types of aquatic species, definitely understand what we're talking about here. So the first one we talked about is plankton. These guys drift, okay? They don't swim, they don't crawl, they don't cling on anything else, they just drift. And there are a few types of plankton out there. There's cytoplankton. These are primary producers for most aquatic food webs, okay? Cytoplankton uh, basically are going to uh, photosynthesis, okay? Uh, so they float around the ocean, uh, they're green, right? They have chlorophyll, they take in uh, sunlight, uh, and they and they uh, do photosynthesis, and they're the primary producers for most aquatic food webs. Ultraplankton are tiny photosynthetic bacteria, okay, that float around the earth, drift around the earth's uh, uh, global oceans. And then we have something called zooplankton, which are actually secondary consumers. Uh, they range from single-celled to large invertebrates like jellyfish, okay? So cytoplankton, ultraplankton, zooplankton, all right? These are your types of plankton. And again, these aquatic species are drifting. So you'll notice on the left, there is a, a jellyfish. This is actually a type of drifting zooplankton that is a secondary consumer. It does eat other fish, uh, if you've ever seen a jellyfish do that. And on the right, we have a starfish, which actually isn't a fish. It's called a sea star uh, because it's actually not a fish lying there on some coral. Okay, so next uh, we have swimmers, okay? So nectin is what we call swimmers, and nectin are strong swimmers like fish, turtles, or whales. All right, why we call fish, turtles, and whales, we group them into this nectin, not exactly sure, but just understand that that's what nectin means. Swimmers who are strong, all right, fish, turtles, and whales can give you uh, 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 some examples for that. Then we have something called benthos, okay? These are bottom dwellers. Oysters, sea stars, clams, lobsters, crabs, okay, these would be bottom dwellers, and they're going to crawl in, in, in many cases, right? Uh, crawl along the bottom uh, of, of your aquatic system there. And then we have our decomposers, all right, those are going to be mostly bacteria, and they're going to obviously cling uh, to things that are going on uh, in the water. They're going to cling to any dead, uh, dead plant or animal matter, and they're going to decompose that just like they kind of do on land. All right, so just understand these terms. Again, nectin, strong swimmers, benthos are bottom dwellers, and then your decomposers, which are mainly bacteria. So again, key factors in the types and numbers of organisms that we find in these aquatic systems. Again, we went through this before. Obviously, if you see it twice, it's important. Temperature, dissolved oxygen content, availability of food, availability of light and nutrients needed for photosynthesis. Again, you don't get a lot of photosynthesis. You don't get a lot of primary producing, then that's obviously going to affect uh, how many other types of organisms you can get in that area. And then the turbidity, which we talked about a little bit with our lab a couple of weeks ago. Turbidity is a degree of cloudiness in the water, and that is obviously also going to be a key factor in the types and numbers of organisms that we're going to get in these aquatic systems. So, why are marine aquatic systems important? Well, first off, let's talk about saltwater ecosystems. They provide major ecosystem and economic services for us, uh, and they're irreplaceable reservoirs of biodiversity. Oceans produce more than half of the oxygen we breathe. And it also provides most of the rain that sustains our water supply because most of the rain that evaporates into the sky is evaporating off of the oceans because they cover almost 71% of, of the earth, right? So most of the water that produces rain on land is being evaporated over the ocean. And most of the oxygen that we breathe from those, uh, from those cytoplankton, right, that are floating around as our, as our primary producers in the ocean, well, they're producing about half the oxygen that we breathe on the planet. 110. 10 million tons of seafood harvested per year. And the Earth's oceans are poorly understood, potential source for even more ecological and economic benefits that we don't even know of right now. We always say that, uh, you know, space is the final frontier, but maybe the oceans are. We know more about the moon uh, than we know about some of our world's oceans when you get down to the bottom uh, of those oceans. So uh, something something to kind of think about. We know, uh, actually, we've, we've mapped Mars. It's, it, we've had a hard time mapping uh, all the oceans or the uh, ocean floors here here on Earth. We obviously have done that now with uh with, with uh, sonar and, and, and that type of stuff, but still, our oceans are not as understood as, as many other uh, many other areas are. 
All right, so we have three major life zones in the ocean aquatic ecosystem. We have the coastal zone, okay? This is where warm, nutrient-rich, and shallow water resides. This extends from the land to the edge of the continental shelf, makes up less than 10% of the world's ocean area, but contains 90% of all marine species. So again, when we talk about the open sea and the ocean bottom, which are the other two life zones out there, most of of our marine species are not living in the open sea and on the ocean bottom, right? Uh, only 10% of the or of the marine species are living there. 90% of the marine species live in this coastal zone, and uh, that makes up less than 10% of the world's ocean area. So obviously, as we start to mess with the coastal zone and we start to degrade the coastal zone, we are degrading uh, most of, or at least uh, affecting most of our marine species, as again, 90% of them are uh, uh, reside in the coastal zone. And of course, as humans, our main impact going to be that coastal zone, right? Because that's where we're living. We don't live in the middle of the ocean. We live on land. So the coastal zone is what we're affecting the most. And obviously that has the uh, the most biodiversity. So again, unfortunately, a little bit of a lose-lose situation there. Uh, and this is why we need to figure, figure this out. So uh, here is one of these charts that we have in the book. You definitely uh, have a, a general understanding of a few of these uh, ecosystem services that the marine ecosystem systems provide and economic services. You don't need to memorize every one, but I would definitely have at least a few of these in mind. So ecosystem services, oxygen supplied through photosynthesis, water purification, climate moderation, uh, uh, carbon dioxide absorption. We talked about that. Nutrient cycling in the ocean. Uh, reduced storm damage because mangroves, barrier islands, and coastal wetlands and coral reefs protect us uh, from uh, potential storm damage. And again, biodiversity, lots of species, lots of habitats. Economic services that the, uh, the marine ecosystems provide us, food, energy from waves and tides. You can actually harness the wave and tide energy to produce electricity. Pharmaceuticals, harbor and transportation routes, recreation and tourism, who doesn't love going to the beach, uh, employment and minerals. Okay, so again, just uh, some of the natural capital, again, ecosystem and economic services that marine ecosystems provide us. Here again is just a, a look at some of the different types of zones. So once again, here is your coastal zone where 90% of our or our marine organisms live. All right. Then when we get into the open sea, you have the euphotic, uh, euphotic zone, the bathyal zone, the abyssal zone. All right. Just getting uh, deeper and deeper. And obviously, the further down you go in the ocean, uh, uh, ocean uh, here, not only does the temperature drop, uh, but you're not going to get much in the way of sunlight. Therefore, you're not going to get much in the way of of organisms living way down here, all right? So uh, again, 90% live in the coastal zone. The other 10% uh, live in the open ocean, but most of them up, uh, you know, not in the abyssal zone here, all right? So again, just have a general idea of these zones, all right? Don't need to memorize everything here, but I would definitely understand uh, the one, two, three, four zones uh, that you are looking at in this, uh, in this picture here. Okay, moving on. We're now going to talk about estuaries and coastal wetlands because they are the most important. They are highly productive. So estuaries are aquatic zones where rivers meet the sea, okay? And a lot of times we call this brackish water, kind of a mixture of fresh water and salt water, all right? We call those estuaries. Coastal wetlands are coastal land covered with water for all or part of the year. These include our coastal marshes, salt marshes, and our mangrove forests. Very productive ecosystems with high nutrient levels, okay? And you can kind of see where we're getting here. We're destroying our estuaries and our coastal wetlands. And as a result, we're really messing with the biodiversity and the ecological services uh, that these estuaries and these wetlands provide us. In addition, there are something called seagrass beds. I'm going to show you some pictures of these in just a second. Uh, seagrass beds occur in shallow coastal waters. They can host up to 60 species of grasses and plants, and they support a variety of marine species. They're almost like a forest underground, right? These seagrass beds. Uh, and so they have a lot of biodiversity attached to them. 
All right, so what we're looking at here, uh, this is a sediment plume. This is Madagascar, okay, a river in Madagascar that's flowing into a channel here. And you'll notice the sediment plume, uh, that's the turbidity, all right, making this water very, uh, very hazy, right, very uh, cloudy. And this is going to affect what's going on in this coastal, uh, coastal area here. Uh, this is a coastal marsh down in South Carolina. Again, I'm sure many of you have seen stuff like this, again, covered with water for most of the year, if not all of the year. And again, a lot of biodiversity. Not only do we have uh, sea gra uh, grasses and flowers and plants, but you have a lot of, a lot of different organisms living uh, in, this, uh, in this coastal marsh. Here we have a mangrove forest. This is off the coast of Thailand. And again, this is what mangroves look like. They have roots that kind of grow right into the water and they live here along the coastal areas. Uh, you can imagine, you get a storm uh, coming in with waves, right? With wind, like a hurricane. These can protect the shoreline, they're like a natural barrier. You get rid of all these to maybe put in rice paddies, for instance, right? Then the next storm comes in, boom, all that flooding comes inland because you take away your uh, your mangrove forest here, which again, help, uh, help one of the ecological services that they provide us is a barrier uh, against storms. And here are that seagrass beds I was talking about. This is uh, near San Clemente Island off the coast of California. And you'll notice not only do we have these huge seagrass, again, looks like forests under the water, but look at all the aquatic uh the aquatic species that are living uh, in this area. So again, uh, these seagrass beds, uh, huge uh, harbingers of, of biodiversity. All right. Uh, so then talking a little about estuaries and, and coastal wetlands. Now we're going to talk a bit about rocky and sandy shores. And they, again, are going to host different types of organisms. So we have something called the intertidal zone. You may have noticed that on that uh, zone a picture of the ocean that I showed you a couple of uh, uh, slides ago. In the intertidal zone, it's the area of shore between high and low tide. So what's interesting about the intertidal zone is that organisms that live there must survive with daily salinity and moisture changes, right? High tide rolls in. It gets wet. It gets rather salty as all that water moves in. And then as uh, low tide, the tide goes out, then the land area dries out a little bit, right? Uh, the the uh, salinity will drop and then it comes back in again. So back and forth, if you're living in the intertidal zone, uh, you need to be able to deal with those daily changes of salinity and moisture. Uh, rocky shores are pounded by waves and we have barrier beaches, otherwise known as sandy shores. Uh, most organisms burrow, dig, or, or tunnel down into the sand. So once again here, just uh, have a general idea of some of these creatures. You have a rocky shore beach on the top. You have a barrier beach on the bottom. Again, rocky versus sand. And again, just a different type of organisms that live there, right? You got a mole shrimp living here, sandpiper. Um, you got some beach fleas, right? A tiger beetle, etc. Some crabs. Uh, with the rocky shore, a little different. Maybe you got hermit crabs. Uh, maybe you got some of this sea lettuce and kelp up nearby. Maybe some of these uh, Monterey flatworms, et cetera, et cetera. So just notice the difference and understand the difference uh, between a rocky shore beach, there's your picture, and a barrier beach or, or a sandy beach, uh, and there's your picture there. And again, different organisms are going to live uh, in these beaches because, again, uh, speciesization, right? We talked about natural selection a couple of chapters ago. Obviously, what helps you survive on a rocky beach may not help you survive on a sandy beach. And so different creatures evolve uh, to better uh, suit the environment that they are living in. All right, critical concept, the importance of wetlands. So we kind of talked a little bit about wetlands and, and their importance. Let's talk about it a little more. Wetlands are areas that are saturated with water all or part of the year. Uh, they have standing shallow water with emergent vegetation. Again, I showed you pictures of that. Uh, they contain communities of plants and animals that have adapted to continuously wet conditions. Freshwater wetlands, okay, include swamps, marshes, bogs, fens, and prairie potholes, all right? So again, now we're talking about uh, kind of uh, the freshwater wetlands, even though, again, similar to your saltwater wetlands in, in, in how they look, but obviously uh, different creatures are going to be living there because we're talking about freshwater. And again, swamps, marshes, bogs, fens, prairie potholes are just some examples of those freshwater wetlands. Again, saltwater wetlands include the estuaries, the mangroves, swamps, and the coastal marshes. Both provide many ecosystem services. Okay, so final uh, chap, final slide for part one here. Just revisiting the coral reefs. 
our amazing centers of biodiversity. Uh, again, these coral reefs are the marine equivalent, equivalent of tropical rainforests. Uh, but unfortunately, reefs are being destroyed and damaged worldwide. Ocean acidification, right? We talked about ocean absorbing carbon dioxide. Uh, that carbon dioxide reacts with ocean warmer to form ocean water to form a weak acid that decreases levels of carbonate ions needed to form coral. So unfortunately, that weak acid doesn't allow the coral to form. In addition, the warmer waters, okay, are also uh, causing the coral to bleach and die out. Uh, so again, uh, these coral reefs, you can think of them again as what uh, the, 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 water equivalent of tropical rainforests. We talked about how important they were to biodiversity. Uh, coral reefs just as important. And unfortunately, we're destroying them uh, just like we're destroying those tropical rainforests. All right, guys. So this will be the end of part one, chapter six, aquatic biodiversity. Uh, tune back in for part two. And as always, thanks for listening.